Thank you very much. I see lots of friends in the audience. Thank you all for coming. Um, I feel slightly awkward at this session that if you look at the program, the title of my talk is Significance of Rice Policy and Investment for Future Rice Food Security. It doesn't actually say anything about Africa. <clears throat> I don't actually know very much about rice in Africa. I have to correct just a bit. I was actually influential in the book on West Africa, but it was Scott Pearson, Chuck Humphreys, and Dirk Stryker who were the actual authors of the book on the rice economy of West Africa. That book followed on uh, a book and two journals and a whole bunch of working papers that Wally Falcon and I had done on the political economy of rice in Asia uh, from the, really that was the, the early 1970s when that work was done. Um, and then we, it was when the Food Research Institute at Stanford was still very active. Uh, and, and, and so Scott and their striker, uh, Chuck Humphreys, uh, sort of took that political economy framework to, to West Africa. So I was engaged with that, but ended up, um, I, I had left Stanford by the time and gone to Cornell. So I didn't have my name on, on the book. Uh, I wish I had. Uh, I, that remains an influential book. I mean, if we want to understand where the rice economy of the whole continent, but especially of West Africa, uh, is, is coming from, what the historical roots are, uh, of the rice economy. That's as good a place to start as, as any. Um, my experience, as most of you know, is primarily working on the rice economy of Asia. When we talk about rice food security, that will be heavily driven by events in Asia. And I apologize for missing what I hear were some wonderful discussions yesterday afternoon in this room. Uh, but we had a whole bunch of ministerial representatives from Asia uh, a across the way with uh, Minister Cao Dao Phu uh, from Vietnam sharing a, a roundtable discussion on the, the future of, of rice security in Asia and in particular a discussion of a task force report that the Asia Society and ERIE produced. I have one of the members of this, uh, a task force right here uh, in, in the room. Uh, it was a pretty distinguished group of members of that task force. Uh, Robert Sue represents the Asia Society. He's here. I'm sure, Robert, you do have copies if people would like to, to, to get a hold of that. Um, we, we talked about the recommendations that came out of this task force report. <laughs> Uh, as I said, uh, jointly done with uh, the Asia Society, the International Rice Research Institute, and a whole set of recommendations that I think would push the, uh, the investment and policy environment forward in a very positive way. We focused mostly on Asia, that was our terms of reference. Uh, but I would argue that uh, the technology part, the, the non-farm economy part, the safety net part and the provision of public goods in research and trade all are relevant in the African context as well as in the Asian context. So if, if your sole interest is developing the rice economy of Africa, I would still urge you to get a copy uh, and, and take a look at that. <clears throat> um, my take, my, my interest in, in the rice economy in Africa is the role it plays in the global rice economy. Africa has become a very important player uh, because it's become quite a significant importer. Now, I hear my colleagues in Africa describe that as a failure, that something's wrong with Africa, that it has to import rice. I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, you're. People have a demand for rice. Their incomes are rising enough that they can afford the rice. They're buying rice from, from the market. I hope in our push for investment in the rice economy of Africa to 
that you do not try to do that inside a sealed wall. That would be extremely inefficient. It would be bad for global food security. And if you cut yourself off from the world rice economy, it will be bad for African food security. So my presentation this morning is from the point of view of how does Africa participate in the world rice economy as a more efficient producer. No reason in the world why Africa should not be a more efficient producer, but also as an efficient consumer of rice. So I want to do, I want to talk a little bit about both. What is driving rice consumption in Africa? This, Sam knows this is a really tough question. In the book that will be launched tomorrow, celebrating Erie's 50th anniversary, is a chapter on the long-run dynamics of rice consumption. By long run, we really mean long run. We are doing projections out to the year 2050, trying to figure out what economic growth structural transformation, changing population growth, uh, growth uh, rural urban uh, migration. Well, what are all of these sort of long-run structural factors doing to the demand for rice? And we do it globally. And then we try to do it by region. Well, we've got a pretty good fix on these long-run dynamic factors in Asia, which is to say we have a pretty good fix on something between 80 and 90 percent of rice consumption in the world going forward. Uh, we can see pretty clearly the negative income elasticity of demand for rice in Asia playing out as income growth accelerates. We can see very dramatically the reduction in rice consumption when somebody leaves the farm and goes to the city as part of the structural transformation. We can see the slowing population growth in Asia, slowing the, the, the overall demand for rice. Those forces are pretty clear. And you can roll those forward with reasonable confidence. We cannot see any of those forces visibly in the African story. All we see is over the last 40 years, rice consumption in Africa has been growing at 3.4% per year, and there is absolutely no evidence in the time series data that that trend is beginning to slow down. There is no negative quadratic term in the time series equation. It's growing at 3.4% a year, year after year, and if you roll that forward 40 years from now and do not do something about production, the projection is Africa will be importing 100 million tons of rice. Now, I don't think that can happen. But I do think Africa could be consuming 50 or 60 million tons of rice, even on a conservative basis. And then the question comes, where do they get it? Are they going to grow it domestically, efficiently? Are they going to buy it? from the world market. If so, how's the world market going to provide volumes like that? 30 million tons tests the capacity of the world market now to get up to 50 or 60 or 70 million tons uh, a couple of decades from now strikes me as a serious challenge. So what I would like to do the rest of my time, and I know we're saving time for questions, I want to ask then what is it Africa will be doing on the investment side in terms of production, productivity growth, vis-a-vis -vis what it's going to be doing on the trade side and participating in, in the world market. Um, I've been hanging around the, the URI scientists for long enough to know that there are viable technologies that will fit African ecological settings, that if they're not totally available right now, they could be in five years or ten years. There can well be an African rice revolution from the technological point of view. I think it's going to be physically and technically possible to do that. And I know there aren't very many rice breeders. There's uh, some, some problems getting that geared up. But there's a lot of spillover from the kinds of varieties that get developed for the difficult environments 
in East and Southeast Asia and South Asia, there's a lot of spillover from those varieties that might work in similar ecological settings in Africa. So I'm pretty optimistic that we're going to find rice varieties that work reasonably well uh, in, in the African context. What I am not so confident about are investments in the other critical areas uh, beyond technology that will be absolutely essential. They will be binding constraints on whether that technological potential actually gets turned into production. We already heard the lack of infrastructure, the fact that there are many productive areas of Africa that are more or less cut off physically from the market. And if they're cut off physically, then they're cut off from the flow of goods, they're cut off from the price formation, they're cut off from the market services, they're cut off from the, the whole supply chain, both inputs and outputs. Well, infrastructure, that's, I think, roads first and foremost, but, um, but it's irrigation if you're going to use really high, high end, high yield rice varieties, you're going to need some kind of water control. But increasingly, if you're going to have reasonably high quality rice, you're going to need a milling uh, sector, a, a modern, relatively sophisticated milling sector if you want to compete with the quality of rice that's coming in. Uh, from, from outside. And so the infrastructure investment all the way from the ports and the roads, the communication systems, maybe some water control along the way, but m very much including the quality dimensions in the marketing system and the milling capacity. Mills are expensive if you're going to put in a big mill with storage capacity and drying and have the, the quality uh, dimensions. And how those are going to get financed and where they're going to get located uh, I think is a huge unknown in the, uh, the African context. And there's a real catch-22. It's awfully hard to get the private sector and farmers to invest in growing a lot more uh, high-quality paddy if there's no place for it to go. But why would a miller invest in an expensive new mill if there isn't any paddy around? Uh, and so somehow we have to grow these two things together there's enough of a national planner in me to say, gee, maybe the government could actually help solve the coordination problems that are involved here. Um, but there's also enough of a skeptic in me to know that governments don't actually do that very well. And so I think we have to put on the agenda how you're going to solve that coordination problem between expanding production and expanding the milling and marketing capacity so that they actually mesh reasonably well. Uh, as, as we go forward. Even if we can solve that, I think we then have the most difficult problem remaining, uh, and that's the policy environment. Uh, Prabhu stressed yesterday in, in the open session uh, the, the difficulty in putting in place, and the term he used was sustaining a favorable policy environment for the rice economy. That was specifically not how do we make sure farmers have a profitable rice uh, sector. That, that's part of it. But policy actually has to cut from inputs to farmers to the marketing chain to consumers to trade. It has to include uh, the reality that, that that trade system is out there and important. And it is the key indicator of whether you're efficient or not. If you're competitive against reasonably high quality inputs, imports, you're, you've got a competitive rice uh, economy. And if you've got to put up 30, 40, 50% barriers to keep cheap rice out because you just can't compete against that, then, uh, then you've got a problem. You are going to, to be a high cost producer. And that's going to have real consequences then for the welfare of your consumers.